Hello from Nick.js, everyone. We are thrilled to release a new reborn version of our free plugin named Mollusk. It is dedicated to land use change simulations based on different mathematical algorithms, and it can help you with predicting how land cover at your territory of interest will look like in the future. And now it is available in the latest QJS versions. In this video, we are going to cover a typical workflow. We will prepare the data, go through all processing stages in Mollusk, and take a look at the results. As a bonus, we will publish the whole project as a web map using Next.js platform capabilities. And we should start with understanding the problem we are going to solve. So let's imagine that we have land use, land cover map relevant for some period of time. Let's say year 2017. We have another land cover map of the same territory, year 2022. So we have the dynamics of land cover for this five year period of time. What we want to do is first to describe these dynamics. What exactly had changed? Second, we want to predict which changes we will have in another five years, in 2027, and maybe in another five years, in 2032, and so on. To predict that, we want to take into account some environmental factors which have influence on these changes. For example, elevation and its derivatives like slope angle or aspect, uh, proximity to urban lands, proximity to major roads, to water streams and bodies, etc. It is up to you as a modeler to choose these factors. Factors could be both continuous and categorical. To have a relevant example, I would take some real world data. As a land cover maps, I'm going to use Modis MCD 12 Q1 product. It is a global yearly uh, land cover maps with 500 meter special resolution. I will take three data sets from NASA Earth Data Portal for 2012, 2017, 2022. They are in HDF format. Then I will take some basic data for influencing factors, digital elevation model, I'm going to calculate slope from it, a vector layer with some major road. Uh, it will be used for road proximity calculation. I also want to calculate urban lands and water bodies proximity maps, so I will also take vector layers with urban areas and water bodies. I used our data.nextjs.com geospatial data store for obtaining this data. A lot of data sets are available here, vector base maps, elevation data, etc. The main advantage of this data store is that I can choose the exact territory I need and exact format I need and JS platform I need. So I receive ready to go styled project for QJS, ArcGIS or another software I use. To sum up what we have, let's open the directory and name inputs. Three land cover HDFs for 2012, 2017 and 2022 vector layers with roads, urban areas, and water bodies, raster with digital elevation model, and the boundary of territory of interest. I chose the whole country of Slovakia. Next step is data preparation. To run Malusk, we need to have all the inputs as rasters of similar size and extent. My initial land cover maps are single band rasters with size 2400 and 2400, so I need to turn all my other data to the same format. Each dataset should be a single band raster with 2400 and 2400 pixel size, placed in the exactly the same extent as land cover maps. Of course, your data could have different sizes, it is just an example. Also, your region of interest could be of any scale national park, city district, the whole country, etc. The main limit for all used rasters is that the rasters must have the same geometry properties, the extents, sizes, and coordinate reference system. So it is time to open QGIS and start working. First step is to add all the data I have to QGIS, step by step. So I drag uh, land use map for 2012, and there are eight different land use classifications provided using different schemes. We will use the particular uh, scheme um, named, named uh, FAO LCCS2, 
which is available here under the key name LC Prop 2. Here it is. So I select it and add. Great. Do the same for 2017 and uh, 2022. Great. Uh, detailed descriptions of different land use schemes in this product are available in the official doc. And uh, now elevation raster. Um, great. And roads and urban lands and water bodies. And finally, uh, the boundary of territory of interest. Great. Uh, important to note that um, source land cover data sets are in some specific uh, sinusoidal projection, uh, which was detected by QGIS, but named unnamed. Uh, so it's not a problem at all, it's okay. And we will use this projection for the whole project because I want to avoid reprojecting the most important inputs, land cover rasters, not to damage them. Second step is to reproject my boundaries to this sinusoidal projection and clip all three land cover rasters by it. I will use standard QGIS tools. So this expert tool, I select this unnamed project coordinate reference system and write results to new folder. And then delete previous version of my layer. Great. Uh, next step is to clip my land use rasters by this uh, boundary. I will use another standard tool of QGIS available in processing toolbox named clip raster by mask layer. So I select land use map for 2012, select Slovakia as mask layer. Uh, I should enable this checkbox, keep resolution of input raster, and set the destination to output file. File I will call it and use 2012. Run it. Yeah, great. So I can repeat it for 2017 under the same configuration. And 2022. Great. Now I have three clipped land cover rasters and uh, I will apply style to them to set up colors and category names. I have one prepared style for this. And now I can see category names, uh, fine colors, etc. I'm going to copy the style and apply it to all three land use maps. Very good. And uh, I also create, I will also create a dedicated layer group. So let's call it land use and put all three maps there. Okay, very good. Um, it is very important to note that for the best experience with Mollusk plugin, we recommend to use um, this Paletted unique values render type with configured colors and most important category names. It will help you a lot in the future. Okay, next step is to transform the rest of the data to the same special domain. I would start with elevation raster and the easiest way to transform it is to use a raster calculator. Um, so I select elevation values at the on this content in my expression panel and uh, after that I select one of my land use maps and push the button use selected layer extent for them then I choose new name it will be them transformed then add the extension so it's okay I can run the processing Great, um, looks good. 
now I can calculate all derivatives I need based on this uh, elevation. In my case, I want to have slope raster. So let's find slope two in processing toolbox and calculate it based on our transformed digital elevation model. Slope. Great, uh, looks very good. Um, now, I think that we could also clip it with the region of interest. So I return back to my clip raster by mask layer tool, and I'm gonna to clip slope raster with Slovakia mask. Keep resolution of input raster checkbox, and write the result to slope clip. What we have here, yeah, great. We have accurately clipped uh, slope raster. Let's delete all the layers we don't need anymore. Only three also. In this group also. Great. So um, let's go ahead. It's time to process vector data. Uh, proximity maps are a very popular factor for such kinds of simulations. That is why I decided to show how to create them in this video. Uh, let's take the major roads layer and rasterize it. Uh, first, I have to reproject it to our main coordinate reference system, the standard workflow. Uh, so I select this new unnamed reference system and create new layer, roads, Reproject. Good. Now I'm ready to rasterize it. I find this um, rasterization vector to raster tool. Select rods reprojected as input layer. Uh, set one as a fixed value to burn. Select pixels as output raster size units. And now I should set uh, width and height uh, of my land use maps. So I'm going. I'm going to open properties of this one of these layers, and on the information tab I can find these width and height values. So I just remember them and they write them right here. Let's check one more time. Eight hundred sixty-three and one hundred forty-five. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, I also should uh, should set the output extent by the same layer. Great, and let's save the results to roads rasterized. Run the processing. Let's check the results. Disable all layers. Enable roads rasterized. Yeah, I have rasterized roads. Uh, looks good. Now I can run next to proximity calculation. I take my roads rasterized layer. I set one value as um, pixel value uh, to be con considered as target pixels. Um, I select pixels as distance units unit, and I select the output name. So roads proximity run it and take a look. let's take a look at it wow super so what is proximity map uh we got let's take the identification tool and click at the random pixel so what i have here is uh the distance in pixels from the closest road. So yeah, it's very useful data set. Uh, the last thing to do with it is to clip it with our territory of interest. So I run this clip raster by mask layer. I select Slovakia as a mask layer, roads proximity as input layer. I select um, keep resolution of input raster checkbox and try the results to new raster named road pro, roads proximity 
equipped. I also should set a specified no data value. Uh, it should be any negative value. Uh, and I'm going to set minus one. So let's run it. And yeah, result looks exactly as we need it. So I, I'm deleting uh, all data I don't need anymore. And uh, we have prepared two vectors, uh, slope angles and based on digital elevation model and roads proximity uh, based on vector layer with roads. So um, repeating the same procedure for any vector layer you have, you can easily build proximity rasters which are extremely helpful for many JS applications, in particular landscape studies. I won't repeat this procedure for other data sets. It is all the same workflow, so I will just get some pre-calculated rasters um, and add them to our project. Yeah, so it is urban proximity raster and water bodies proximity raster. And uh, now I'll create a layer group named predictors, organize my project predictors. I will put all these four layers there and I will delete everything I don't need anymore. I will leave the boundary uh, layer just to have some refer reference. I will just disable fill color and make the stroke a little bit wider. Yeah. Okay, that's it. We are ready to run Mollusk now. Um, Mollusk is available in the standard plugin manager. So let's just open it and try, try to find it, Mollusk. Yeah, here it is. Um, now it is available for the latest QGIS version. Just push the button install plugin. And after being installed, Mollusk could be found in the raster menu. Let's see, here it is. Uh, you, can you can find here quick help link, about link and the plugin itself. So I'm running it. At the input stop, I have to set all modeling data. On the left side, I can see all available raster layers in the current QGIS project, and I should select initial land cover map and final land cover map. To do it, I select the 2012 map and set it as initial. Then I select 2017 and set it as final. In the second column, I can write the years of each, 2012 and 2017. So my model will be learned on the example of land use changes between these two periods. Then I have to select special variables. What I think drives these changes? This selection is very important and it is in fact an implementation of your hypothesis. We have demo case and factors here mostly have demonstrational sense, but in real modeling you should pay a lot of attention to it based on your understanding of your territory. I will select everything we have calculated, a slope, a roads proximity, urban proximity, and water bodies proximity. So, okay, add. And after selection, I have to push button, check geometry, to ensure that all inputs have the same size and extent. Okay, great. After this message of successful check, I can see that the next steps have been enabled. So the next step is evaluating correlation tab. Here we can perform correlation analysis for our selected special variables. We can do it pairwise, but usually it's faster to enable check all rasters. Three methods are available. Pearson's correlation is the classic one for continuous data and Kramer's um, coefficient and uh, joint information uncertainty are designed to process categorical data. I select Pearson's correlation and run a check. 
In this matrix, I can see a correlation between all inputs. If it is very high, let's say more than 0 0.7 for some pair, it could be better to exclude one of such predictors from analysis. Next up is area changes map, and it's very important. Here we should calculate transition matrix and class statistics. Let's push update tables button. What do we have here? Yeah, the top table shows general statistics for both input land cover maps. I have class names and colors in two left columns, thanks to properly configured style of rasters and QGIS project. Third column shows total areas of each class at first land cover map. First column shows the same for second land cover map. Fifth column contains delta, uh, the amount of changes in each class for the period between our two maps. And last three columns show the same thing, but in percentages instead of square meters. meters. We can also switch to square kilometers or hectares. Bottom table shows the particular transitions of each class during our period between maps. For example, it shows that almost 6% of open forests were transformed to dense forests, or almost 4% of water bodies uh, were transformed to natural herbaceous. It's very helpful information. We also should generate changes map by pushing this button. Let me name it, changes. Great. Um, it was added to project automatically. Let's take a look at it. It is. Um, this raster describes which transition happened in each pixel. You can see it by the legend. Yes. Um, to explore it, I advise you to go to properties of this layer, to attribute table tables tab and create a new attribute table from current symbology. Good. After that, with the standard identification tool, uh, I can examine any pixel and get convenient information about its changes. Let's return back to Maluk. And uh, next step is uh, transition potential modeling. So it is about building the model. And it is why we are here, isn't it? So uh, we have four methods available here to build the model. Artificial neural network is the main for Malusk, and we will use it. You can also choose weights of evidence method, multi-criteria evaluation method, and classic logistic regression. Please find out more information on them in docs and reference papers. Uh, now we will focus on um, artificial neural network method. First thing we could set up is samples policy. Yes, so let's expand this menu. We can configure the number of samples from how many points to take the data to teach the model and the mode. Points could be placed randomly or they could be placed in stratified mode, which means that program will try to more or less evenly distribute points in different land use classes. Um, neighborhood defines how many neighbor pixels would be considered as affecting the transition in a particular place. If it is zero, then no special context of pixels would be considered. If it is one, then three at three windows would be analyzed for each case. If it is two, then five at five windows would be analyzed and so on. Basic recommendation is to use one, in some cases zero, but you can always play with it and compare results. Learning create is a very basic neural network hyperparameter. It defines the step of the learning process. Uh, how much to change the model in response to the estimated error? You can decrease this value to make the learning process more cautious. Maximum iterations parameter defines the limit of learning cycles. You can decrease it to make process faster and to avoid overfitting in some cases. But too low value could cause model underfitting. Number of hidden layers is about the architecture of a neural network. The more this number is, the more complex the neural network would be, with a larger amount of internal parameters to be optimized, etc. 
you can leave it default in most cases. And momentum is another neural network hyperparameter. It defines the influence of the previous learning process step on the next learning process step. Sometimes playing with it could improve model quality, leave it default for the first run and then make small changes, rebuild the model and estimate the effect. I will increase the number of samples to 5,000, uh, decrease learning rate significantly, yes, to 0, 0, 0,05, uh, decrease max iterations to 350, decrease hidden layers count to 5, uh, decrease momentum to 0 0.01 and train neural network. I can observe the learning process on the graph. Let's wait for the first output. Yeah, at horizontal axis, I have iteration numbers. At vertical axis, I have overall validation error for each iteration. This estimation um, performs for both training and validation data, so we have two lines. Ideally, the model should improve a little on each step. If you observe something like that, it means you have bad context. Input special variables or model parameters. You can stop the process, reconfigure the model, and run the process again. And if you see that quality is increasing on training data but is decreasing on validation data, it means that model was overfitted. Usually it means that there are too many input parameters. Reducing the number of hidden layers uh, also could help. Uh, main thing to look at in terms of quality is current validation kappa. Um, the closer it is to one, the better your model is. Yes. For now, our current result is quite good. We can say that our current model is able to explain approximately 88% of changes on training land cover maps. Uh, playing with hyperparameters, with samples number, with use special variables, your interest is to get the highest validation kappa. So the final result is 88%. After the training process is over, we could also save samples to the vector layer just to take a look at them. The button save samples, name it samples. Yeah, it was generated and added to the map. Here we can see based on which situations our model uh, was trained. Sometimes it could be reasonable to show your model more situations and to increase samples count. Next up is Seller Automata Simulation. Our model is trained and now we are ready to make a prediction for the future. We could generate the following products here. Transition potential maps uh, will show us the estimation of probability of each kind of transition in each pixel. Let's activate this checkbox and uh, select some folder to generate these rasters. Create new one. Okay. Um, certainty uh, function raster will show us how much the model is confident in prediction in each pixel. It can give us useful information on how to improve the model, so let's generate it. Uh, and the simulation result is the actual prediction. How our land use will look like in the future. We can select the number of simulation iterations here. Uh, one iteration covers the same period of time we have between our input land cover maps. We have five years in our case. So if I set one iteration, I will get a prediction for 2022, which is not the actual future, but we have a possibility to compare it with the real data. And if I set two iterations, I will get a prediction to 2027. So you can predict for as far as you want. I will set one now and run calculations. Um, name it sim2022. Let's start the process. Great. And after that, I'm disabling the transition potential maps checkbox, certainty function checkbox, rename this file to 
2027 and put two in this number of simulation iterations field and run the process again. Okay, uh, it's finished. So let's explore the results. On a certainty raster, we can see areas where our model is very confident and where it is not confident at all. It is useful information to tune our hypothesis. Simulations, uh, simulations are ready to go um, rasters with land use classes and the same legend as input maps. It is our main result. And so I can see uh, the result of our model predictions. And let's take a look uh, at the folder with transitions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have maps of transition potential for each pair of classes. Yeah, let me add some random one. Yeah. Uh, here you can see particular places where such a transition is possible according to the model and its potential rate. The closer it to 100, then more confident our model is that this transition would happen. So uh, in general, these transition rasters also could be uh, very, very helpful. Great, we are almost done. Validation tab can help you to explore your model quality if you have a reference map for the model period. We created a model for 2022 and we have real data for it. So let's try to run validation. So I have this simulated map, SIM2022, and I select, I should select a reference map, so MODIS for 2022. I have it in the data folder. No, in the roads folder on the name LU2022. Yeah. Uh, so I activate all checkbox and run the validation. It could take some time. Yeah, it's done. Let's push the calculate couple button. It's our metrics. Uh, they are acceptable, more than acceptable. And I would also create a validation map. Here it is. Uh, let's explore it. Uh, in each pixel, it contains information um, about class value on a simulated map and class value on the validation map. Let's repeat the trick with the raster attribute table. Okay. Uh, and let's now explore some pixels. Um, if the value has uh, persistent label, then simulated map and validation map are the same in this location. It's good. For other cases, we can see the real condition on the left, yes, and predicted condition on the right. This information also could be very helpful to tune and improve the model in next iterations. Uh, we also have a multiple resolution budget plot here. It shows actual quality of all our modeling on different special uh, scales. It is this purple line. Uh, and also shows quality for hypothetical situations. When we have less location uh, and quantity information, and when we have more location and quantity information. That's it. We have finished basic Mollusk workflow. Hope it was helpful and have a nice simulations, everyone. Um, to expand the project perspective, let me show you as an addition, as a bonus, let me show you another plugin we created, Next.js Connect. It allows us to connect to the Next.js web server and publish a QGIS project to a powerful web environment. Before we proceed, I will make QGIS project more readable, just setting setup names and order, order the layers. So, remove this one. I will create new group named simulations. I will delete this 
validation is for empty rasters. Uh, as long as changes raster. Put Slovakia on the top. Disable everything except simulation on 2027. Uh, okay, I think we good. Uh, so yeah, the plugin is available mm, in the standard models repository named Thanks.js Connect. Here it is. Yes, uh, so I open it. I establish the connection to some uh, WebJS I have. Uh, and then I push just one button, name the project. And in one or two minutes, the whole project would be uploaded to the web map. Let's wait a little bit and take a look. That's it. We have got a web map looking exactly the same as the QGIS project with styles preserved and legends preserved. Yeah, you can see. Uh, I can explore vector layer futures attributes here if I want to. I can make a lot of things here. I can share this map. I can embed it into some website. I can print it with a legend. Uh, let's try to set up something, uh, etc. So uh, you can also add this map as a to QGIS as uh, configured projects with the same plugin with the same one button click this one add to QGIS. So if you are interested, follow the links in the description and these QR codes. We have a lot of interesting stuff. For example, our WebJS has an integrated tracking model and field data collecting model with a special mobile app to gather JS data in the field. Uh, so feel free to reach out to us to learn more. Also, if you have questions or ideas regarding Mollusk, don't hesitate to tell us. We have community forum, chats on different platforms and more places to communicate. So thank you very much for your attention. And bye.